Gene Shepard. the black pit. <laughs> I just thought that I would warn you before we begin tonight's show that if you are one of the sensitive ones, one of the queasy ones, I would like to respectfully suggest that you get the hell out of here. You have no business here. You know what I said? I am serious about it. I got some real bad stuff for you tonight. I mean... Bad stuff, if you will, please. No, 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 no. Echo, please. <laughs> just wanna, just wanna clear the clinkers out here and get ready. I mean, if you're a banshee, by God, you gotta know how to be one. Just sitting here, see, contemplating the infinite contemplating the evil that lurks in the hearts of men everywhere every place you look and you can find it in the most inconsequential the most innocent looking packages for example I'm sitting there reading uh, one of my favorite journals the uh, London Observer which I always read of course <laughs> one of the just a little under the financial section, for example, it says um, there is not free trade yet in the six countries of the European common market. You know, the European common market, you know about this scene. If you die in Luxembourg and want to be cremated, the nearest crematoria are in Strasbourg or Metz, which are both in France. <laughs> well, bodies are then sent to France, and they're neatly cooked, and then the ashes are returned to Luxembourg with a 10% value-added tax, because the value has been increased when it returns, and they're ashes, and they put them in a little pot. And that's the kind of evil that is lurking in our world today. I mean, you're worth more when they reduce you to ashes than when you're laying there full-blown, you know, they're Tongue hanging out and your eyeballs popping out. <laughs> oh, that's evil, friends. May I uh, please try another little evil 
Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> well, listen, that ain't... Hold on, hold on. I said stop it. I don't like to mess around. You notice how tough I am tonight? That's because it's the end of the week, man, and I'm beginning to feel the sap rising. I'm beginning to feel it rushing through my brains, my head pounding and pulsing with passion. <laughs> it's the weekend. <laughs> Excuse me. I mean, I get carried away at times. I just thought I'd warn you that uh, you better stay in back from the radio unless you want to get tainted by the passion virus. So I'm going to reach out and grab you. Oh, yes, yes. You think that that's an evil... Well, listen to this one. There's a little picture here. You see this guy standing there dressed as a... As a uh, as a, uh, <laughs> as a Napoleonic soldier, this is in the paper. This is the kind of stuff that's going on. Listen to this. It says, again, in the Observer, it says, uh, We drove out to Waterloo, for old time's sake, and ran into Norbert Brassine, 65, a one-time mechanic, now a full-time collector of Napoleonica. He has thousands of volumes on the Emperor. His family owns a restaurant allegedly built from the relics of the battlefield. Brassine produced a cardboard box full of malodorous bones, which he claims his ancestors collected after the battle. He takes out his box of bones once in a while and sits there and enjoys them like any other relic. Malodorous. He says the British government has offered to buy his collection (laughs) for the nation. He likes to dress up like the old guard for what Napoleon's warriors called la croix et la prune. Otherwise, the Belgians don't go in much for eccentricity. However, old Norbert has his box of bones. Now, wait a minute. Don't laugh. Don't laugh. Oh, no. Think of this for a moment. Think about it for a moment. He has collected the bones of the soldiers that were collected on the battlefield at Waterloo. Bones, bones. <laughs> bones. Have you ever run into anything like that? Have you ever personally ever run into a collector of, uh, well, let's say, uh, gruesome mania? You have it. I have. My God, what I have seen. What I have seen, I shouldn't even tell you. In fact, uh, you know, this doesn't really surprise me at all, because I one time had an... uh, Well, the first time I actually ran into a thing like this, I was about, I guess, nine. It's a sickening story, and I'm going to warn you, before we go into this story, I'm going to warn you, it is a story that is liable to cause you to get up and jump up and run out into the john to wretch for about a half an hour. I'm just warning you. I don't want you to write back to her, Mr. Shepard. That story was in bad taste. My my cat was sick for a week. After he... I'm sorry, madam. I'm warning you. You must have fiber of steel to listen to this story. It's a sickening story. <laughs> oh, no, I shouldn't. Yes, you want to hear it? All right. All right. Before I tell you this story, you know, we've got we've got a couple of commercials here. It's just a sickening story, so you stick around. I got a couple of commercials here. I've got to get them out of the way. A couple of commercials. Let's see. We got the flying bird. Hey, listen. Some guy wrote to me and he says, "Hey, Shepard, listen to this. I found this picture in a Woman's Day magazine. I turned the page and I practically fainted. Yeah, I saw the picture. So it shows this chick standing, you know, model type with her kid." And what has he got? He's got a flying bird, just like the kind that we've been hawking on the show here. He, he says, these flying birds are fantastic. I'm going to buy another one. He says, I've already owned three of them. I want another one. And if you don't have one of these flying birds, you get your check in the mail right now. Check or money order to Flying Bird, W-O-R, Flying Bird, Department S. Get this, Flying Bird, Department S, Post Office Box 1909, Grand Central Station, New York, New York. Now, these birds really fly. You just wind them up. And by the way, if you really have an evil sense of, uh, you know, the kind of gruesome, you can paint your bird jet black with radium wings and fly it at night with evil eyes peering out of the little beak 
And uh, they're only 398. Think what you could do with this thing. New York State residents add tax, naturally. The Flying Bird comes packed in a box with instructions for assembly and operation. Even you can put it together. And it's guaranteed to fly. Specify white, dove, or yellow bird. Send check or money order. No cash. Send check or money order. Flying Birds, Department S, Post Office Box, 199, Grand Central Station, New York, New York, 10017. Flying Birds, out of the way. Yes, I'll tell you, I, I, I don't know whether to, to go full-fledged. Into the, we have also, let's see, we've got the bank there, Provident Bank. Let's see, let's see, Provident Bank. Hey, Savers. Hey, you guys out there that are packing your dough away and hiding it under the mattress. March 31st should be good news for most of you, but uh, good news because on that day, most banks will credit interest to your savings account, some at 5% a year, some as low as 4%. Interest is credited and available in most banks every three months. Well, you better find out about Provident. Provident, because they get their 5% dividends posted to their account, anybody that has money in that bank, on the last day of this month and every month. Not every three months, but every month. And that makes a big difference. So uh, you can bank by mail. It's real easy. Uh, just uh, They'll send you this kit free, postage paid. You just write Provident, name of me, Provident, and it says name of personality. Right, address it to that, or just write Provident, name of personality, W-O-R, New York, 10018. And uh, you can call them on the phone right now. Call MU26800 right now. Operators are standing by, member, FDIC. Boom, ba dum bump. Hey, we've got commercials here tonight, but I'll tell you, it's worth sticking from, sticking around for, friends. Because uh, this, this this story is, uh, I've been I've been thinking about telling you this story. Now I want you to remember Norbert. Remember Norbert, the guy that collected the bones at the battlefield at Waterloo. Probably right this minute. You know, there's a big time difference between here and Belgium. Right this minute, Norbert is probably sleeping the sleep of the just. He's just about to get up in the morning. Uh, you know, have a little coffee, maybe a little croissant, like they have in Belgium, and then to sit cackling over his box of bones. <laughs> After all, he's retired. What else does he have to do? He, you know, he takes the bones out and he throws them up in the air, and you know, like, uh, well, you've seen, you've seen how uh, Silas Marner dribbles the money over his head and runs around. You know, I can see old Norbert there with them bones, just you know, running his hands through them, throwing them up in the air, and inviting his friends in to see him. Speaking of old bones, this is W.O.R. and I'm going to do it now. This is you. You'll just have to accept it, friend. This is W.O.R. New York. And now, I have... I want you to listen now. And now, I have a very important announcement. Important announcement time. It is now time to listen to a really serious announcement. Turn up your radio. Turn up your radio. Get out your pen and pencil. Because... Shepherd live in Red Bank, New Jersey. <laughs> okay, we've been getting about 500 calls and letters a day about this, and here is the dope. Tickets now go on sale Monday at all Ticketron outlets for the greatest show of the year. Me, Gene Shepherd's spring total orgiastic bacchanal. Yes, this is celebrating both spring and the anniversary of the great Orpheum Gravy Boat Riot. And if you miss it, don't come whining around later and sniffing around to me. Friday, April the 7th at 8 p.m., it all happens at the fantastic Carlton Theater in beautiful, picturesque downtown Red Bank, New Jersey. And we've also had a special attraction, the Sinful Street 2, which is a perfect group for a Bacchanal. Now look, there is only one performance, so you better get your tickets now. I repeat, Monday, tickets will be at all Ticketron outlets. For the Ticketron location nearest you, call area code 212, here's the number, 644-4400. Now, the Carlton Theater is easy to reach right off the Garden State Parkway. You better not boot this one. New Jersey may not be the same again. Gene Shepard, the Sinful Street 2, live, lights, uproar, it'll wreck your head. Tickets go on sale Monday at Ticketron, just like the hockey games. Presented by Stagger Wing Productions, April 7th, 1972. Will be remembered throughout all Red Bank, New Jersey history. Ah! Yeah, yeah. 
Exciting, wasn't it? Yes, this is WR, New York. We'll do it again for you. you know, they're more worried about things like that than what you put in between the station breaks, but that's the way life is these days. I am forever blowing bubbles. I am looking for... You know, I'll tell you, I must say this, though, before we <laughs> leave the subject. Uh, you know, most of my live performances, that is, stuff I do on stage, are done in colleges. And unfortunately, most colleges limit the audience to people who go to that school. That's just the way it is. And uh, I get letters probably uh, three, four, or five, maybe oh, 15, 20 a day sometimes about people saying, how come, you know, you don't do a show for the general public? Well, this is it, man. Uh, last year we did one at Town Hall. And uh, this year it's, uh, you know, this, this theater is a fascinating theater, by the way. They have such stuff as the... The ballet goes there. Oh, it's an elegant theater. And we picked it for that reason. Curious theater. All right, enough of this. We'll be there April 7th, 1972. That's a Friday night. Get your babysitter, the whole thing. Get your rubber truncheon ready. Uh, let's see. We got a couple of... <laughs> you don't know what a rubber truncheon is? Well, you look that up. That's uh, tonight's uh, homework. Hey, incidentally, the only way to judge book clubs is by their list of titles, of course. And we have here tonight the Book Find Club. And they seek out only the best of contemporary fiction and nonfiction, all kinds of great stuff. And as a special inducement to join now, Book Find will send you for just a buck plus postage and handling two extraordinary books that cost about 15 bucks at bookstores. For example, Ravel's Startling Without Marks or Jesus and uh, F. Lee Bailey's The Defense Never Rests. So you call now if you'd like to join the Book Find Club. The number is TN71441, TN71441. And as a member, you're obliged to purchase just two more books in a whole year. Phone TN71441 right now. They're on duty. Yes, sir. All right, enough of this stuff here. I'm going to tell you a story, man. I read this, you know. I, I just I just picked this up, see, and I could see old Norbert sitting there. And he's, I know, I know exactly how many are left. I can just see him throwing those bones up in the air there and dribbling them down over his head, you know. And I thought, you know, I wonder how many people have ever had an experience like that. Well, it can happen to you. I mean, <laughs> when you least expect it. I'm about nine, see. And, um, you know, you, you never know what people's, what, what are contained in people's lives. You walk past these guys' houses. And you look there, and it looks like a house. You know, you see a fern in the window, and you see a swing out of the porch. And you figure, you know, it's just a plain ordinary house. These people are just walking around, you know, <laughs> making sandwiches, eating peanut butter, and watching TV and stuff. Don't you believe it. There is more than meets the eye. Norbert's sitting there dribbling those bones over his head, cackling. That's just scratching the surface. I'm about nine, see. I was about nine, I guess, yeah. And I was, I was going to the Warren G. Harding School. Now, this is a time when you're made out of tinfoil. You know, you just, you're, you can be bent in any direction. Now, had I not seen this, had I not had this experience, I could very easily have been one of those nice, warm, smiley guys like Mike Douglas. <laughs> you know, who really believes in Phyllis Diller and stuff like that. Really loves it. Oh, yeah. But I was changed forever that afternoon. Into a totally different guy. I'm about nine, see. And up to this time, the only thing I ever saw, the most exciting thing I ever saw was like, you know, stuff like, uh, like, uh, chocolate Easter bunnies. You know, kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Once in a while you'd see, uh, a raggedy ant doll. You know, maybe you see an Airedale walking down the street, biting somebody. You know, that's about it. That's about the extent of the horror in your life, you know. Well, I'm walking home from school one day. And I am with Schwartz, and I am with Flick, and I am with Bruner. We're walking down the alley, as we often did, kicking a tin can along. We had these, you, you know, kids invent games, continually inventing different games. They'll play the same game for about three days, and then they forget that one. They don't play that anymore. And they invent rules as they go along. 
And we had a game that involved carnation milk cans. You know the little milk cans? And we'd look in the garbage, we'd find a carnation milk can, and instantly we would stomp up and down on it, making it into a little ball of tin, you know, just stamp it around. And it becomes like a tin puck is what it becomes. Real sharp puck. And instantly we divide into teams, me and Schwartz and then Flick and Bruner be on the other side. And we would kick this can down the, down the alley towards home. It was a running game that had no defined goals. Except, you see, we had various goals that we went. If, if, if the, the guy that would kick it, let's say, into, uh, Mrs., uh, Mrs. Snyder's garbage can, if you could kick it in, had a big concrete garbage can with a thing open there. If you kick it in there, that's two points. And, uh, then there would be a battle for that. Then somebody would fish it out and you'd start kicking it forward again. The first game, yeah, all little rules. So we're kicking this can down the street there, down the alley. We're kicking away there. And there's this kid with us named Jack Martin. Now you don't hear me talk much about Martin on the show. Because Martin was a sinister figure, in a way. He was a lone kid. He would sit in the corner, you know, and never say much. And he'd sit around in funny smiles. So, Jack Martin, you know, Jack Martin is trailing along with us as they were kicking a can along there. See, well, we we come along past Martin's house. See, each kid would, as he would hit his house, he would peel off, and the game would uh, change. You know, we'd get to Schwartz's house first, then Flick's house, then my house. After that, would come Broner's house. Each kid, you know, sort of tails off. Well, here's Martin. See, we're going along. Martin's house is first, so we're kicking a can along. He's just with us. See, he's not part of the game. He's just with us, so we're kicking a can. And the, all of a sudden, Martin, without any, without any cueing, says, hey, you guys want to come in? I'll show you something. Yeah, I've never been in Martin's house. There's some kids that just are not part of the crowd. You don't go in his house or anything. You just know this kid. That's it. It's the first time he ever said this. Hey, you guys want to come in? I'll show you something. My first impulse was, hey, you know, kick the kid. Schwartz says, what? Martin says, well, I'll show you when we get in. Flick says, what are you going to show us? Martin says, wouldn't you like to know? That's a typical kid answer, you know. Wouldn't you like to know? Flick says, eh, no. He says, well, I'll show it to you if you come in. Well, Bruner says, let's go. Flick says, eh, okay. I said, all right. Schwartz said, is anybody home? Martin says, no. Nah. My old man's at work. My mother's ain't home. Okay. So we go drifting through the backyard. First time I've ever been in Martin's backyard. We go drifting through the backyard, up the back steps. And Martin fishes over the top of the door and gets the key down. You know how they hide the key on the top? He opens the door and says, come on in, you guys. And he had his, his house was kind of dark, you know, with the shades pulled down. So people live with their shades pulled down all the time, you know. Shades pulled on, you can smell. Every house I've ever been in has a distinctive smell of the family that lives in that house. It, 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 I'm sorry, it does. <laughs> and it's it's never changing. I can still smell what Schwartz's house smells like. I just I, the minute I walk in, there's that's the Schwartz smell. Funny smell, you know. It's the smell of that house. Doppler's house had another smell. <laughs> Flick's house had a smell of twelve thousand dogs. Yeah, yeah, everyone named Zero. He had, a, he had dogs. <laughs> That's just, I, every time, you know, I don't go past a place where I smell dogs, it's Flick, you know. Well, here I am in the Martin house. He has a funny smell. And the smell was a little bit like yeast. You know what yeast smells like? Yeast. It's Martin's house. We're in the kitchen now. It's dark. So Martin says, you guys want anything to eat? And he opens the refrigerator and a lot of stuff in the refrigerator. And Flick says, yeah, what do you got? So I got some Cokes in there, so we're popping a Coke, and we're sitting there making a Coke. And finally, Schwartz says, what are you going to show us? Martin says, I don't think I should. He says, what do you mean you don't think you should? You got us in here because you're going to show us the stuff. I don't think so. Bruder says, oh, come on. Will you, you get us in the house here. What are you trying to do? Martin says, well, I don't think I should. It belongs to my dad. Oh, oh, that's something else. And Flick says, belongs to your dad. What is it? He says, I don't know. I don't know what I should show it to you. Flick says, come on. Come on. By this time, you know, we're all sitting Yeah, yeah. What is it, see? He says, well, look, you promise you won't tell nobody about this. 
I'm going to tell you something, friend. This is the first time I have ever told this story. I will guarantee. In fact, I was not even reminded of any of this stuff. I sort of blocked it out of my head until I ran across this thing with Norbert, with the bones of the Napoleonic soldiers and malodorous bones at that. Martin says it belongs to my dad. I don't think I should show it to you. And Flick says, you think? What do you mean you don't think you should show it to us? How come you said you were going to show it to us? What do you, what, 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 you know, what do you, I, I'm already half an hour late for going home, you know? Martin says, look, don't tell anybody if I show you this. And Schwartz says, oh, don't worry, don't worry. And at that point, all of us, he says, come on down in the basement. All of us went down into Martin's basement. Now, his basement was the first one I saw like this. His basement was done up. It was finished. It had a, a playroom down there and all that stuff, you know. Our, the basement I lived in, where our house was, had a bunch of old all-state tires piled up to the ceiling, you know. And uh, a lot of uh, old pieces of angle iron and stuff down there and a lot of wheels and junk and uh, a washing machine and stuff. But his basement had linoleum on the floor. And it had wood around the walls. And it had a pool table. It's the first time. It was a whole new thing. St. Flick said, hey, look at a pool table there. And uh, with that, Martin says, don't touch him. I'm mad. I'll make it's real mad if you play pool on him. He says, because, you know, he really gets mad. Don't mess around with it. He says, I want to show you what he's got. And so we go past the pool table. I can still see the scene. I did not have any idea what you know, I was about to see. And, and Martin says, now, don't tell anybody about this. Don't tell anybody. And he opens this cabinet, which is on the side of the wall. And in the cabinet were these pool cues. These pool cues are all sitting there, see? And in the cabinet were some shelves right under the pool cues. We're all standing around looking, see, wait a second. It was a funny smell. Very funny smell. As soon as he opened that cabinet door... Vin. He says, now, don't tell anybody. Car. And he had a Prince Albert can. One of these pound cans. You know how they're red? Prince Albert. There's a picture of Prince Albert on the side. Have you seen them? The Prince Albert tobacco cans. It was on the shelf. He says, this is my old man's. Man, if he sees me showing you this, he's really going to skin me alive, man. This is... He takes out the Prince Albert can and he carries it over to the pool table. Puts it on the pool table. And says, now look, after I show you this, don't mention it to anybody. And I can only show it to you for a couple of seconds and we got to get, get out of here. Because if he finds me messing with this, it's all over. So we're all hanging over the pool table. And he says, look, he takes the top off. And we all peer in. He's got this yellow light bulb lit over our head. In the can is a wad of cotton. He says, now watch, look at this. He takes the cotton off, and there inside was this little brown thing. It was on another wad of cotton just laying in there. And I look down in to see what it is. And just then, Schwartz goes, Ah! Oh, what is it? It had a fingernail on it. A fingernail on that little brown thing. And then I saw what it was. It was the second joints. The fingernail and the first and second joints. Of a finger. A finger. And it was brown and dry. It had a fingernail on it. And flicked back so said, what is that? What, where'd you get that? And Jack Martin said, it belongs to my dad. You know whose finger that is? Flick said, whose? Jack Martin said, did you guys ever hear of John Dillinger? That is John Dillinger's little finger. Ah! 
What's a John Dillinger's little finger? What, what do you mean? Where did you get? What? How, where'd your dad get that? It's, my dad was in the next block when Dillinger was shot. And he ran down there and saw all this stuff going on and all these people. And he saw it was Dillinger. And this is what he got. Well, we looked at it and hung around for a second. And Martin put the top back on and stuck it back in the cabinet. We went back upstairs and not one of us said a word. Martin says to Schwartz, why don't you finish your peanut butter sandwich? Schwartz says, well, I'm going to have supper pretty soon. Oh, I'm going to have supper pretty soon. And, you know. Well, thanks, Martin. That was real interesting. <laughs> He says, you won't tell anybody. Schwartz says, I won't tell nobody. And I said, I won't tell nobody. Bruner didn't say anything. He just gulped. Flick just stood there and sweat. We went out the back door. Me and Schwartz and Flick and Bruner. We got back out in the alley and Flick says, let's kick the can. Schwartz says, oh, I don't want to kick the can. We walked down through the dusk. You're listening to a guy that saw John Dillinger's left little finger. That's what they said it was anyway. God only knows what it really was, but I can tell you this. It sure as hell had a fingernail on it. That I know. <laughs> It was going to be a sickening story, didn't I? I told you it was going to be a sickening, rotten story. And that isn't the end of it. That is not the end of it. Because not more than three months after that, the sequel to it was even more fantastic. That's why I told you not to listen tonight. I mean, I doubt whether any of you have ever seen the finger of a live, walking around human being in a Prince Albert can. Not one of you. You know, I couldn't make up something like that. <laughs> oh, my. Before we go any further, we got a couple of other commercials here. Let's see, what do we got? Yes, one, two, three. We got Shoe Town. Yeah, Shoe Town. Let's see, get on with this one. Where is it? I don't see the commercial. Oh. Yeah, here it is, Shoe Town, yeah. Hey, man, Mr. Mark, Shoe Town's head buyer, you know him, of men's shoes, wants you to know how he's liberated today's men from the high cost of buying fine quality shoes. Man, it used to be that if you wanted high quality shoes in the very newest fashion looks, you had to lay it out, man. You still have to in other stores, but not at good old Shoe Town. Thanks to Mr. Mark, Shoe Town has thousands of first quality famous maker shoes for Easter and spring, and they're all priced many bucks below what you'd pay for these same shoes, by the way, elsewhere. Men's casuals are Shoe Town priced from nine ninety nine to fourteen ninety nine. Dress shoes valued to $35 a pair are just $14.99 to $25.99 at Shoe Town. So with so many great styles done in really smooth, patent, and suede leathers, you're going to find what you want, man. Shoe Towns. Mr. Mark has made Shoe Town a great place for men to shop. You'll choose from hundreds of new season styles. You'll be helped by trained sales personnel. And by the way, there are over 30 Shoe Town stores in the suburban metropolitan New York area. So check the white pages of the Suburban phone book for the one nearest you if you live out in the old suburbs. Hey, you know, speaking of, uh, <laughs> you know, I'll tell you that, that, uh, that, that's not the, that's not the, uh, the worst story though. You know, that, that is a special kind of person though that collects, I don't know what it is. <laughs> well, I don't know. You say sick. I don't know. That's a, that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, what is sick? I, I'm just saying that's, that's a special kind of crazy person, really nutty person. I remember, oh, I've seen some scenes. I'll tell you. Uh, I, I remember one time, uh, in the same, not more than three months later, in the same scene, I saw this guy, see, <laughs> he says, he says to me, there's another kid, see, 
He says, hey, do you want to see something? I said, what? Oh, I better not tell you this. I said, what? Anytime somebody sidles up to you and says out of the corner of his mouth, hey, do you want to see something? You got your choice right there. You're going to see something you may not want to see. Or you can go ever and through your life and forever be one of the innocent ones. <laughs> I'll tell you. This kid says to me, hey, do you want to see something? I says, yeah. He says, well, come with me. Well, right next to the school, there was a swamp. And uh, this swamp, this swamp was a uh, very wide, tremendous wide swamp. And it's like the Jersey Marshes out here, you know, it had cattails and all that stuff. So he says, come on out to the swamp with me. So we go out to the swamp. And I don't know where, how this ever happened, and then who did it or why. We go through the woods and the weeds and the weeds and the water and the swamp and the glop. We go about a half a mile. He says, wait, you see this? And there, sitting amid a pile of rubble and cattails and trees, was a little shack. He says, take a look at that. Somebody. I'm just telling you exactly what I saw. I shouldn't tell you this. This is going to have you screaming all night. Somebody had, well, I better not tell you this. It's a terrible story. No, you don't want to hear this. No, no, I better not tell you this story. No, it's it's a terrible story. I mean, when I saw this thing, I almost flipped. <laughs> well, all right, there was a shack in a swamp. And you wonder why why I have this curious sense of of uh, what's going on. This when you see things like this, you, you you just can't turn around. Anyway, here was this little shack. It was made out of old wood, and it was tumbled down. I'd seen it many times. It, 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 you know, when you go out in the swamp, the kids would play out there, and uh, it was always there. And it was old, and it had been there for many years, and it was just practically uh, decayed, and the roof was falling down. It was, it was nobody could live in it or anything. It was just an old battered old shack in the middle of the trees with cattails all around it, water and swamp. And we knew how to get through to that. See, we could hop from island to island and run through the mud and up and down this thing. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I better not tell you this. All right, give me a little of that spooky music, man. I'm going to tell you. There, nailed to the side of the shack, believe it or not, Well, I might as well come right out and tell you. It was a hand. Bring it up big. Somebody had nailed a hand. Son. That's all, right, just a hand. Well, I was about 20 feet away. Son. <laughs> ah! Oh, my God. Oh, it's still. Have you ever seen a hand nailed to something? There was a hand. And it was a nail right through. It was on the side of this bell, you know, right there. I swear. Hey, Scott, what is it? He says, don't go. Oh, wow. He says, I saw it the other day when I was on the swamp. <laughs> well, the two of us, it scared us. We were, we, you know, he had seen it before, but now it scared him all over. And we ran like hell back to this place. Back to school. We ran back to the swamp. And I'm about, you know, 50% hysterical. We get back out to the, to the playground. We're walking through the playground, and, and I said, we got to tell somebody about that. And he says, oh, don't tell anybody. I said, I'm going to tell. I want to tell Mr. Sanderson. He says, don't tell him. We're going to get in trouble. I said, oh, I'm going to tell him. Mr. Sanderson was the school janitor. <laughs> and he was always there by the front of the school. So, so I said, i got to tell him. He says, oh, no, don't. We're going to get in trouble. I said, come on, Scott. We're going to tell him. And the two of us went over. And this guy said, yeah, he's got a corn cob pipe. He says, what's, what's the matter with you guys? I said, there's a, there's a hand out there nailed to the shack out in the woods. He said, hand, are you out of your mind? I said, yeah, there's a hand. He said, come on, you kids, are you putting me on? Said, no, there's a hand out there. And he took off like a bird. He ran into the swamp. Five minutes later, <laughs> he's back with blood in his eye. There was a hand nailed to the side of that building. I'm not going to tell you the rest of it. Bring it up there, please, Pip. 
That's for next semester. <laughs> oh, man, thank you, Bill. That's enough. I, I don't want to tell you anymore. Okay. Now, you wanted to hear the end, didn't you? Of course. Now, what if I told you I got five years? I spent them in the Michigan City pen, huh? Would you accept that? Yeah, you probably would. <laughs> That's the trouble. <laughs> yeah, then I'd have to... Of course, then immediately, five agents would call me up and try to get me, you know, get me folk singing gigs. But, uh... <laughs> Nevertheless, <laughs> the sequel of this is insane. Uh, we were called up to Miss Norton's office. She was the principal. And uh, me and this kid and, and uh, Mr. Simonson, Sanderson, rather, all, all of us are, you know, he, he drags us in there. And he says, tell her. And so we told her we saw his hand. He says, yeah, there's a hand out there. There's a hand out there in the swamp. And, and this became, incidentally, a, quite a cause celeb. So at that point, she says, I'm going to call the police. So she did. And about 20 minutes later, and we're sitting in the office waiting to see what, you know, is going to happen. The police came. They went out there. This police sergeant came back. His face is as red as a beet. Somebody had nailed a glove to the side of the wall. And all, all, all of us had seen, every one of us had seen a hand when we went out there. It was the swamp. It was, it was being out there in the woods with the snakes. It was being out there with the cattails, with the wind blowing. And the spooky sounds going through the trees. It was just out there and began to rot your head. I saw a hand. I swear it was a hand. Mr. Sanderson saw a hand. Everybody saw a hand. Except the police sergeant. He saw a plain, ordinary work glove. It was kind of white, you know, a glove. Somebody had nailed it there. But I want to tell you this. You see a hand, a glove, nailed to the side of a building, man, and that'll scare you. Speaking of, 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 <laughs> of scary moments, I am going to be... Let's see. I've got to find it here. Or should we save this for... No, no, let's give it a little... All right, listen, I'm going to... No, no, we'll save it for... We'll save this for next week. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, okay? Yeah, we'll save it for next week. Now, look, uh, if, if you think this is a spooky story, wait till you see what happens in Red Bank, the 7th of April. Oh, no. You know, we're, we're going we're gonna to unload. I'll tell you. Uh, I, I can... Uh, I could tell you stories. Cause you know, I, I think the, the grotesque is always just on the edge of our, our subconscious. And it is. There's, there's no question about it. That, that what is it in us that makes us want to get scared? People love horror stories. Now why? You, you'd think they wouldn't like them. But it's evil. It's like the time all of us, me and Flick and Schwartz, creeped up to this house one day. And these people were having a seance. You ever seen a seance from the outside with the red light hanging over the table and all these people sitting around the table with their hands on this table? And one of the one of the people, this lady, sort of an old lady, was leaning back in her chair and her mouth was open and she was making these strange screaming sounds. <coughs> look through the window see we're watching this i mean oh let me tell you the peeping tom sees a hell of a lot more than bare bottoms friends i can guarantee you that there's some things he doesn't want to see and we're all looking through the window at this thing <laughs> with the red light bulb and the, the worst part of it is that i always took the paper to this lady i didn't you know she was the lady who I always took papers to. I was a paper boy at the time. I never could look at her the same. After that moment, with her eyeballs rolling and she's screaming, and there's a trumpet hanging up in the air there and it's blowing something. And you could see Abraham Lincoln's head floating around in the darkness with the red light flickering over it all and a hand tacked to the side of a shack out in the swamp. Dillinger's finger with a fingernail on it. Oh, God. Oh, the evil that lies in the hearts of men. Only the deep pit knows. The deep, deep pit. <laughs> I 
remember. I, I, I warned you. <laughs> I told you. I told you it was going to be bad news. This is WOR. You stay tuned for Lester Smith and the News.